recapping One More Thing by Apple, and more coming up on today's episode of the latest in tech news. Hey Gadgeteer, you're just in time for the latest episode of the world's only 3-in-1 show on tech, gadgets, and gaming news. That's right, this is the latest in tech news. My name is Taylor Merrick, and uh, if you're new here, hope you consider sticking around and uh, listening to the latest articles that we got lined up for you today. We like to cover like three different categories, as it were of news so uh you are definitely in the right place and if you are a long time listener welcome back you're gonna like today's show speaking of what's to like well apple uh had another event earlier today and we're gonna be recapping what uh exactly went on today so uh you'll want to be definitely sticking around for that it's our feature article so it'll be coming up right after this We'll also be taking a look at the PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5 transition uh, that will take about three years here, give or take, according to Sony. Um, maybe why it is or isn't important, it kind of depends, because there is going to be a transition period uh, when you update to a new console uh, and games have to update. It's par for the course is usually how it goes. We'll also be taking a look at, uh, well, we finally know the reason why Ninja chose to go back to Twitch, so we'll be jumping into that. I know you're all like, why oh, Ninja, you stupid, I watch Dr. Disrespect now. Well, being that it has been, I've covered Ninja on the show previously along with other streamers, I tend to keep an eye on what's going on in live streamers, um, esports, things of that nature. Uh, I kind of like to keep an eye on certain things for certain reasons business tech related so you might you might find it an interesting reason also we'll be taking a look at josh.ai launching a nearly invisible amazon echo competitor that's the size of half dollar actually pretty sophisticated if i can say and finally we'll be taking a look at the falconeer a game coming out for the latest xbox console so With that being said, let's head on over to today's feature story. Speaking of feature stories, um, do you guys know like when I try to go over to the screen and it doesn't load right away? I think it's a Streamlabs thing because I'm doing a scene transition and it doesn't want to switch over right away. It's being stupid on me. I have a dual screen setup. I'm really mad. I'm about ready. This close. This close. If you're watching on video, this close to taking... My fist being like Andy on the office. Pow right through one of the monitors. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So today's Apple event recap. So um, the Apple had their one more thing showcase earlier today. And I said on yesterday's show I was going to recap what happened today. If there's anything good that came out of it. And a bunch of good things came out of it. Well, what were some of them? Well, it's re- they revealed a new lineup of Macs uh, packing Apple's powerful M1 processor. Now that the next generation of Macs are built from the ground up with Apple's own hardware and software working together, you can expect faster speeds, better battery life, and overall better efficiency that matches the seamlessness of using an iPhone or an iPad. And this article is coming to us courtesy of Tom's Guide, so uh, I will have a link to this in the show notes, but if you missed the big show, here's a quick breakdown of all the new products. There's the Apple Silicon MacBook Air. Um, it's M1 powered, promising 3.5 times the CPU speeds and five times the graphics power as its predecessor, as well as up to 18 hours of battery life. I, I think there's a lot to be said behind the um, processor running the beast. Um, especially seen as how it like 3.5 times the CPU speeds, five times the graphics power, 18 hours of battery life compared to its predecessor, the previous Air. Wow. If you're interested, you can pre-order it now for $999 or a sweet 1K. Um, over that with tax, however that works out. There's also the Apple Silicon MacBook Pro. The upgraded MacBook Pro is built to deliver 2.8 times to the CPU power and five times the GPU muscle as the previous generation. You also get up to 20 hours of battery, the longest ever for a Mac, which is quite impressive. Definitely a first. It'll be uh, available now 
starting at, well, right around $1,300 US. There's also the Mac Mini, their tiny desktop, getting an M1 upgrade, packing three times the punch performance model, and uh, compared to its predecessor, and up to 15 times better machine learning capabilities. Better yet, it's even cheaper than before at just 700 US dollars. I guess they also got a link of um, archived live blog and the uh, Apple event for November, so you can watch the whole video there as well. Um, the new Macs are set to ship next week. Oh, and Mac OS Big Sur is finally arriving on November 12th, allowing you to enjoy a ton of new software upgrades on your MacBook or Mac desktop. Um, and you go a little bit over the MacBook Pro, MacBook Air. Um, yeah, a couple pictures about that. Um, the M1, the software. Um, Mac OS Big Sur is designed to be fully optimized around a new CPU and unlock new tricks and experiences. Um, it, it's interesting. The Mac will instantly wake from sleep, just like an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, it was demoed by opening a Mac with a cheesy R&B music playing in the background. Uh, you can expect better overall snappiness on Apple Silicon Macs, as well as a boost for intensive tasks like editing photos and videos. They have more of a unified memory architecture, which is definitely a big thing. It allows apps to work more seamlessly. A um, bunch of universal apps working on both Apple Silicon and Intel machines, with companies like Adobe already working on their own universal Mac software and a special tool called Rosetta, allowing non-native Intel apps to run on the Mac. Uh, and then you go over to M1, a bunch of stuff there. And then, uh, yeah, mainly mainly the Mac. So, yeah, kind of, kind of interesting. What are you guys looking forward to the most here now that you've heard the news? Let me know down in the comments if you're watching via video. Otherwise, uh, let us know on the Discord server. Details on that can be found at technewsgadget.net. All right, moving on over to our next article here. And if you guys are interested in trying to catch up with the video side of things, feel free to hop on over to youtube.com forward slash tech news gadget. And there you can watch the videos of today's show or shows in the past. I'm kind of bringing it back. I'm wondering if I should just chop it up into segments. Would you guys prefer I do that? Let me know if you're watching via YouTube in the comment section, if you would prefer these news segments to be chopped up and uploaded as segments or if you want the full show um for show i can do both or one or the other um it's just i whichever one gets more traction i guess is what i'm saying so uh feel free to let me know in the comment section so playstation 4 playstation 5 transition is is underway um it will be taking about three years to complete According to Sony, expect a mix of cross-gen titles and PS5 exclusives over the next three years. Um, obviously, they want to get you upgraded to the PlayStation 5 as quickly as possible. But if you're on a PlayStation 4, it's going to be like, ah, new game, PlayStation 5 only. Ah, I have the 4. Um, <laughs> speaking of which, on yesterday's show, I covered Godfall, which is a timed PlayStation 5 exclusive. Um, that will be available only on PlayStation 5 for the first six months. And I have a PlayStation 4, so I'm like, I gotta sit here until, like, shoot, May? Just to be able to play it on my console? Should I just upgrade to the new one already? I don't know. Like, I'm kind of feeling like I should. Except the... Here's the thing. The only thing holding me back is that my PlayStation 4 is an exclusive. Batman Arkham themed console and I bought it for a reason I don't know if I really want to give it up just yet we'll see who wins in the end uh, but Sony says that they expect a transition from PlayStation 4 to the 5 to last about 3 years a period in which we're likely to see a mix of cross gen releases next gen exclusives by the way this article comes to us from Games Radar in an interview with AV Watch um, the VP 
touched on PlayStation's approach to game development at the launch of the PlayStation 5 and beyond, with an install base of 100 plus million and growing. Um, they explained the importance of continuing to support cross gen releases into the PlayStation 5's life cycle. Um, so let's see, starting off with here, the PlayStation 5 is backwards compatible with most PS4 games, so players waiting to invest in next-gen hardware needn't hesitate to buy cross-gen games on the PlayStation 4. In fact, a number of them are getting PS5 upgrades that will be free to anyone with a copy of the current-gen version. Again, given the amount of people who own a PS4, this makes sense from a business perspective, and it is in line with how, while the PlayStation 3's roughly 10 year life cycle went as well of course we know from next gen exclusives like demon souls and ratchet and clank rift apart that not every playstation 5 game release in that three-year window will be cross-gen for a certain time we asked developers to develop on the premise of cross-gen of ps4 and ps5 for that reason it's probably safe to assume that most next gen studio exclusives um will be coming from first party studios um but upcoming playstation 5 games uh yeah, they got a nice old list set right there for you guys if you want to click on it and read more. And you're probably like, "What are you? What are you? Are you watching something?" Yeah, I'm actually watching the video, and you're watching a video. Unless you're listening via the podcast, I got some more details on that coming up in the next article. Speaking of next articles, we finally know why Ninja chose Twitch. But before I get to that. If you're listening to the show via the podcast, thank you so much. You guys kind of make up the core and majority audience of those listening in from around the world, over a hundred countries. It's incredible. So thank you so much for that. If you do have just a brief moment though, could you hop on over and give us a review, whether you're listening via the Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or, or whatever app that you're listening in? That would be greatly, greatly appreciated, and uh, I will continue to do my best to bring you the latest and greatest tech news articles. On to today's article. This comes to us from svg.com, and... Uh, well, it's about Ninja. You see, Ninja's been having a pretty good time since he returned back to Twitch. However, fans may be surprised to learn just how close Ninja came to signing with another streaming platform entirely. During a recent stream, Ninja opened up a bit about why he ultimately chose to walk away from YouTube and stay with Twitch. Earlier this year, uh, I guess there was a superstar streamer, um, Valkyrie, made waves when she chose to leave Twitch to stream on YouTube, and there's been a bit of of a debate over whether or not this move made Valkyrie a bigger streamer than Pokimane, but the general consensus seems to be that the platform switch was good for the viewership numbers. It seems as though Ninja agrees with this sentiment. While streaming Fortnite together, Ninja excitedly told Lachlan Power that Valkyrie had recently racked up, and I probably just murder, murdered one or both or all of the names, so I'm sorry, I'm not I'm familiar with some of the streamers, big names, other names. Uh, but not all of them. I know. I'm working on it, though. Uh, but Valkyrie had recently racked up 100,000 viewers during a single YouTube stream. This prompted Power to ask if Ninja had considered making a similar change in streaming platforms. According to Ninja, moving to YouTube was a very real possibility at one point. After Microsoft's Mixer shut down, Ninja was a free agent. He dabbled a bit with streaming on YouTube, which we saw, leading many to believe that was where he was going to settle down. Eventually, Ninja came back to Twitch with a brand new exclusive streaming contract. This is where it gets interesting. However, Ninja told Lashlin Power that there was a moment there where YouTube almost became his new streaming home. After discussing how much easier it is to transition from YouTube to Twitch and not the other way around, Ninja confirmed that he had been highly considering accepting an offer from YouTube before he went back to Twitch. According to Ninja, his decision to stick with Twitch over YouTube came down to more of a lifestyle thing. Ninja said he felt like his efforts would have much more of an impact if he was streaming on Twitch. He might actually be onto something in this regard. Over the last few months, Ninja has uh, and Twitch has seen record viewership numbers as different creators, public figures have used the service as a form of outreach. Um, 
On the other hand, there are definite drawbacks to both platforms. When PewDiePie's videos stop showing up in searches, fans are afraid that the YouTuber had been shadow banned by the platform. Luckily for Pews and his followers, it turned out it was just a weird glitch from YouTube. Meanwhile, Twitch has been receiving flack for a new PSA that discourages viewers from using ad blockers, as well as sending out an ominous warning about DMCA violations to streamers, so you definitely gotta be really careful on the music you play if you live stream on Twitch. Ninja also explained that he saw YouTube content creators being given a very different treatment from fans, with a lot of content streaming falling by the wayside. Ninja said, when someone says, you're my favorite YouTuber, almost no one ever mentions your streams on YouTube, right? It's always, oh, you're my favorite YouTuber, and they think of your YouTube videos. Ninja also seems to believe that YouTubers have a bit more of a stigma attached to them than Twitch streamers. He reasoned that YouTubers are almost never applauded for any of their charity efforts or high viewership numbers, but they're always focused on when they make mistakes. An example of this point uh, was when he pointed to uh, Logan Paul's shady moments. Ninja said, no one ever reports on a YouTuber getting a million live viewers or 500,000 live viewers on a stream or raising millions of dollars for charity, right? Yeah, but it should be mentioned that Jack up the guy made headlines earlier this year for raising nearly 660,000 during a charity stream, but Ninja's point is that the drama tends to outweigh the good on YouTube. With that in mind, with Ninja being someone who's no stranger to controversy, it makes sense that he'd want to stay with Twitch over YouTube. And uh seems like it's paid off. Uh he's definitely settled back into that groove with Twitch, but um Outside of that, Ninja has recently set a goal to pursue roles in Hollywood. For now, however, fans will probably be happy to know that Ninja is exactly where he wants to be, which is back on Twitch. <laughs> I mean, honestly, what, go back to Twitch. You're, you're much better there. Even though Mixer had better setup, Microsoft just shot themselves in the foot with that one. I can, I can definitely say that, but that's just from a overall standpoint. Microsoft seems to be really good at squelching stuff that worked out really well and then they pick it up and then it goes uh, why is it broken guys uh, uh, I, well, it was working before and it was like well you, you, you popped the tire oh I did? I don't even know what I did you took a nail and you drove it into the tire and it popped oh, I did? yeah and now it's leaking oil too what'd you do? oh I think I put a nail in that too sorry Microsoft you, you you can't fool me with that. Um, I know that you're big and important and everything, but it seems like, I don't know, this big, ominous corporate machine with none of the fun. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> I could be wrong, but if I am, let me know on Discord or uh, down in the comments. All right, moving on to some interesting gadget news. Josh.ai launches a nearly invisible Amazon Echo competitor that's the size of a coin, specifically a half dollar. Now, for those of you wondering, hey, do you have show notes for any of today's articles? Certainly do. Head on over to technewsgadget.net and uh, you can get the show notes for this or any other episode that you desire. I link directly to it for your convenience although it's easier if you're listening to the show via a podcast because right there in the description when you go to read more about the show um i have the links right in there for you so that you can tap right on the app and uh, it'll take you right to the article in the past several weeks we've seen refreshes and product expansions from about every facet of the smart home virtual assistant world apple launched the home pod mini Google offered a long overdue refresh of the Google Home, and Amazon found even more speaker shapes to shove Alexa into. Uh, and by the way, this is from TechCrunch. Today we're getting an addition from a startup competitor. Josh.ai has aimed to build out a niche in the space by building a smart assistant product that's designed to be professionally installed alongside other smart homewares, and they announced a new product this afternoon. The device Josh Nano fully buys into a more luxury-focused home niche with a low-profile device that appears to be a little bit bigger than a half dollar, though the bulk of the device is embedded into the wall itself and wired back to a central unit via power over Ethernet. The device bundles a set of four microphones eschewing any onboard speaker, instead opting to integrate directly with the user's at-home sound system. Josh boasts compatibility with most major AV receiver manufacturers, in addition to partnerships with companies like Sonos. There isn't much else to the device, a light for visual feedback, a multi 
purpose touch sensor and a physical switch to cut the power to the onboard microphones in case the users want extra peace of mind. Now here's a picture on the screen if you're watching via YouTube. Where is it? <laughs> it's hidden, isn't it? The aim of the new hardware is to hide the smart features of a home and move away from industry standard touch screen hubs with dated interfaces. By stripping down a smart home product to its essential feature, Josh.ai hopes it can push more users to buy in a more full way with confidence that subsequent hardware releases won't render their devices outdated and ugly. The startup is taking pre-orders for the device available in black and white color options and hopes to start shipping early next year. Powering these devices a product the company calls Josh Core, a small server which basically acts as a hub for everything. Josh talks to a you uh, in a user's home, ensuring that interactions between smart home devices can occur locally, minimizing external requests. The startup will also continue selling its previously released Josh Micro, which integrates a dedicated speaker into the wall-mounted hardware. Um, the, the key term here was wall-mounted. I'm going to show you where it's hiding. Right here. Do you see it? Oh, you don't see it. Ah, oh, nuts. Well, for those of you interested, um, it's about 500 per room, but this is more kind of like a luxury kind of um, smart home. So feel free to take a look at it um, and then let me know what you think. I mean, I, I don't know. It looks kind of interesting. It's super small. Um, There's no hub that it sits on, a little speaker desk or anything. It's pretty interesting so hence why i wanted to uh bring this gadget your way all right final article i got for you guys today yes it's a game Woohoo! all right so i saw the trailer for this game and i said this game looks pretty interesting it looks pretty neat why is it for the xbox only it looks pretty good i'm jealous now do i need to get two consoles <laughs> <sighs> well, if you're listening via the podcast, don't worry. I'll have links for you in the show notes so you can go watch the video. But if you're watching via YouTube, you can actually see the image on screen right now. It's called The Falconeer. Yes, this is going to be for the Xbox Series X, S, and the Xbox One. In this game, uh, The Falconeer is an open world air combat game featuring frenetic aerial dogfights and deep exploration of the mysterious open world of the great sea. Generations of poisonous decisions and treason swirl in a deep as factions clash in a fight to preserve the past or flee its terrible consequences. Now we got uh, pictures here for you to definitely take a look at. I mean, oh, <laughs> if you watch the video, you're like, man, this looks awesome. The visuals are good. Uh, it, it seems very smooth. Uh, there's a couple of artistic concepts. Yeah, so keep in mind it is built for the Xbox Series um, for 4K Ultra HD, up to 120 frames per second, smart delivery. Here are some of the features of the game. You can explore, discover lofty heights or mysterious underwater locations. I guess with your Falcon you can fly underground. It, it's, it's interesting because the Falcons are large uh, scale birds that you can actually sit on and to fly around with and, and, and shoot stuff from. Uh, speaking of which, experience fast and brutal aerial combat. You can encounter a wide range of enemies from rival falconeers to lumbering airships, flying beetles, manta rays, crabs, and more. Um, I haven't seen if there's any like um, homing missiles or, or weapons of sort. I guarantee you there probably is. Uh, it's definitely interesting. I guess you can choose your origin story to create a unique rider. You can also earn splinters to upgrade your falcon through weapons, armor, cosmetics, and mutagens. And it's also fully voiced. Um, features stunning original music from award-winning composer Benedict Nichols. So if you've heard that name, it usually means good music, and I heard some of the music is actually pretty good. So... Uh, in, in conclusion to wrap it up, 
become the falconeer and soar through the skies aboard a devastatingly powerful warbird. Uncover secrets lost to the sea as you join or oppose different factions and clans scattered throughout the mysterious world of the Great Earth Sea. Take advantage of multiple faction falconeer classes with individual stats, weapons, and warbirds that can be upgraded through winning battles, completing quests, discovering secrets, or applying mutagens or chance. Use ocean thermals and energy to dive, dodge, barrel roll, <laughs> and twist to gain an advantage. The Falconeer is an open world air combat game um, featuring fast, brutal aerial dogfights and deep exploration of an incredibly open world fantasy set uh, not only above the clouds, but also amongst the waves and down through the sunken ocean depths. It is released as of today. November 10th, 2020, and it is currently only for the Xbox Series X, S, and the Xbox One. Um, I wish I had a link to the trailer, but the, the, it's on here on, on their page. So hopefully you get to uh, click through and enjoy. All right, and with that, that wraps up this episode of the latest in tech news. Thanks for tuning in. New episodes every weekday. The latest in tech news can be found on every major platform, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else podcasts are found, not to mention YouTube. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to let us know by clicking that like button, leaving a comment, and if you're listening via podcast, be sure to leave us a review. Also, double-check that you are subscribed so that you don't miss the next episode. I'm your host, Taylor Merrick, and remember, for the latest in tech, gadget, and gaming news, visit technewsgadget.net. Pretty much keeping awesome, guys, and I'll see you on the flip side.